Good morning. It's a pleasure and a privilege to have this opportunity to open up God's word with you. I'm excited for us to have this time to gather around God's word, to hear him speak to us. I hope that even now uh, you're praying that God would speak to you through his word during our time together this morning. We have the promises from God that when his word goes out, it will not return to him void. So we can pray expectantly, even as the word is being preached for God to move in our midst this morning. That's what we want. And I wanna invite you to go ahead and open in your Bible to Genesis chapter three. In 2024, Station Hill and the broader Brentwood family of churches committed to reading through the entire Bible together. And as we journey through the Bible together in our personal reading, we've also begun a year long sermon series that'll take us through the entire story of scripture from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Last week, we began our sermon series at the beginning with the creation account in Genesis 1, where we learned that the world that God created was very good, right? But the world that we live in now isn't very good. Far from it. So what gives? What happened to the very good world God created? Why is our world filled with so much pain and sorrow and sickness and death? when the world that God created was perfect. And we find out in the passage that we'll be considering this morning. Now, though there have been many dark days throughout human history, what we encounter in Genesis three is the darkest of days from which all other dark days follow. But the good news of Christianity is that even in the darkest of days, there is always hope. And we'll see that hope shining through brightly as this dark chapter draws to a close. So without further ado, I wanna invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. Uh, Last week, in the same way, I preached through the whole chapter, but we just read a portion of the scripture. We'll do the same thing this week. I'm gonna preach through the whole chapter, but we're gonna begin our time by reading verses one to seven as we begin. This is God's word. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. No, you will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Let's go to God in prayer. Jesus, apart from you, we can do nothing. And so we ask for you to pour out the spirit who gives understanding, insight, wisdom, repentance, faith, joy, and peace during this time. Father, glorify Jesus in our midst this morning. And we pray this all in his matchless name and all God's people said, amen. Friends, you can go ahead and be seated. If you're taking notes this morning, we're gonna consider this dark chapter under three headings. The first thing that we're gonna consider and see in chapter three is the origin of sin. Then after that, we're gonna consider the consequences of sin before finally we're gonna consider the remedy for sin. So first, let's consider the origin of sin. Uh, Going back to Genesis one, after God finished his work of creating the heavens and the earth and all that is in them culminating in his creation of the man and the woman, God stood back and declared that his creation was very good. But you don't have to live long 
in this world to conclude that this world isn't very good. If you're visiting today and you're not a follower of Jesus, I'm guessing at some point in your life, you've asked the question, what is wrong with us? What what is wrong with humanity? How could people who are capable of such great good also be capable of such great evil? Not only that, what's wrong with the earth? How can an earth that is full of such beauty, majestic beauty, in fact, also be full of things like tornadoes and hurricanes and wildfires and floods that that wreak such havoc on our lives. Have you ever asked those questions? Well, the answer to them is found right here in Genesis 3. The reason we're so spiritually broken and the reason the earth seems like it's at war with us is because of our sin, your sin, And mine. But where did sin come from if God's creation was very good? I want you to look with me at chapter 3, verse 1. We're introduced to the serpent. Now, some wonder whether this should be understood literally or symbolic. Is this a literal serpent or, or is this something symbolic of some figure who stands for evil? I mean, on my reading, I'm inclined to take this literally because of what we read in the rest of verse one. If you look down there with me, it says, the serpent was the most cunning or craftiest of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. So when God literally made all the beasts of the field in Genesis one, he also literally created the serpent who slithered into the garden and became the instrument through which Satan spoke. And we know that the serpent is Satan because the rest of scripture testifies to that. So I'm thinking specifically here of Revelation chapter 12, verse nine, or Revelation chapter 20, verse two. If you wanna write those down, you can look at them later. But that raises another question, right? Where did Satan come from? Well, according to scripture, Satan was a powerful angel. Think of Ezekiel chapter 28, which I think describes Satan, where he's described as full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. He was the foremost of God's creations in the beginning. He was created by God to serve and worship God, but Satan, along with a host of other angels, chose to rebel against God and were cast out of heaven and down to the earth. And from the very beginning until now, his supreme goal has been and always will be to cause as many people as possible to join him in rebelling against God so that as many people as possible experience the same destruction that awaits him. Now listen, I recognize that talking about Satan is grounds for mockery in many parts of our country, right? The, the downstream effect of secularism's belief that there is no spiritual realm and that everything you see in the world, everything that you can experience is just physical, material stuff means that there is no spiritual realm and no spiritual beings in that realm and any belief in spiritual beings is seen as ridiculous. But I think it's important for us to remember as Christians here that even if the world thinks it's ridiculous, that we should remain committed to what scripture teaches and what scripture teaches is that you and I have a spiritual adversary. I think it's important to hear C.S. Lewis's very clear, poignant and direct words about Satan. He said, readers are advised to remember that the devil is a liar. He lies in animistic cultures by convincing people that he's more powerful than God And he lies in secular cultures by convincing people that he doesn't exist. But the Bible is clear. We live in an intensely spiritual world and we have a spiritual adversary, a personal, malevolent being who is entirely dedicated to your eternal destruction. And the central tactic in his, in his plan for achieving our destruction is to get you and me 
to doubt God's goodness. Getting Eve to question God's goodness is clearly at the heart of Satan's temptation. Notice even the question that he asks in verse one. He asks, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Well, if you're, if you're familiar with scripture and have been reading Genesis two carefully, you would know in fact that God did not say that, right? God said in Genesis chapter two, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden. Notice what, do, what Satan is doing in his question. He wants Eve to focus on the one thing that God has prohibited rather than on the abundance that he had provided to them. And Eve surprisingly follows his lead. Look at verse two. She says, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden Right, she's also failing to emphasize God's generosity. When Satan said the, asked, asked her that question, she should have said, no, that's not what God said. God, in fact, gave us every tree in the garden to eat from except this one tree. And because of the abundance he's given us, we're gonna trust in him. But that's not what Eve does. She also fails to emphasize God's generosity, minimizing his abundant provision. And then even worse, she adds to what God said. Look at verse three. She says, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. God never said they couldn't touch it. He only said, don't eat it. She is minimizing God's generosity and amplifying the prohibition that God gave him, making it sound stricter than it actually was. And what is the net effect? God sounds less gracious and more strict than he actually is. But the reality is the opposite. God is far more gracious and good than he is strict. You can eat everything in the garden except for this one tree. All of it is yours. Go eat, all of it is yours. Go eat of all of it, just not this one tree. If you eat of this tree, you will die, right? You can eat everything. And how does Eve understand his generosity? This is how I'd interpret it. You can eat. But you absolutely cannot eat that tree. And if even you touch that tree, you're gonna die. That's how she's characterizing our generous God. And Satan already sees that she doesn't know God's word as well as she should. And now he sees that there is space to attack her belief that God is good. And so he goes for the jugular. Look at verses four and five. He will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Don't miss the subtext here, friends. Eve, Eve, don't you see? Taking what God has forbidden won't kill you. God just doesn't want you to become like him. God is withholding good from you, Eve. He doesn't want you to become wise. He doesn't want you to enjoy the pleasures of tasting the fruit. What a petty and selfish God, Eve. He is not good. If he was good, he would let you have it. You're fit to rule yourself, Eve. You don't need God to tell you what is good for you. And Eve agrees with him. Look at verse six. So when the woman saw that the tree was good, pause. It's interesting, isn't it? The woman saw that the tree was good, right? Up to this point, only one being has the authority to see and declare that something is good, and that's God. You think back to Genesis chapter one, right? Repeat it over and over again. God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good, right? God is the only one who has the authority to see and declare good, not good, good, not good. Eve then puts herself in the position of God and sees and says, good. And in fact, it was not good. Eve decided she no longer needed God to tell her what is good. He isn't a good God anyway. He doesn't have my best in mind. He's simply keeping me from fulfilling my potential. He's simply feeling, uh, keeping me from following my truth, living out my pleasures and my desires. Why would he do that? He must not be for me. He must not be a good God. And she took and she ate. And sin and death and destruction came into the world. 
I wonder how many of you are in Eve's shoes today, experiencing satanic temptation to doubt the goodness of God and as a result, turn away from God. Let me think about what those satanic temptations might sound like, those whispers in your life. If God was good, he would heal you. If God was good, he would let you act out on that desire. If God was good, he would, he would give you that promotion. If God was good, he would sanctify your spouse. If God was good, he would save your children. You should take matters into your own hands. You should curse God and live for yourselves. You see, in these sorts of temptations, Satan wants you to focus on what God hasn't provided. He wants you to focus on what God hasn't allowed rather than on the abundance that God does allow and on the abundance that God has provided. He wants you to focus on what's hard in life rather than on the glorious reality that if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, God has saved you from destruction. He has promised his personal presence with you to be with you through every trial and storm. And he has promised to usher you into his glorious presence forever. Satan, though, wants you to fix your eyes on the here and now, on the immediate moment, rather than on eternity, because he knows that if he can get your eyes and mine fixed on the here and now, we won't see the big picture from God's perspective. We won't see the glory that God is working in and through our sufferings, our trials, and our temptations. We won't see the eternal destruction that awaits Satan and all who've sided with him, and we will miss out on the glorious reality that awaits for all eternity. Satan doesn't want you to think about those things. He wants you to think about here and now. You have the desire, take it. Take and eat. We miss the big picture because of Satan tempting us to focus on the here and now. We miss out on the goodness of God. One of my favorite illustrations of this comes from the ministry of a man named D.L. Moody. Moody was a pastor in Chicago in the 19th century, had a prolific ministry, uh, ministered there for decades. And over the course of his ministry, there was a particular woman in his congregation who during a period of time in her life was struggling to believe in the goodness of God because of various trials and suffering she was experiencing. So like a good pastor, Moody went to meet with her and talk with her. And when he went to her house, she was working on cross stitching. So he sat down with her as she continued working and they were talking about the goodness of God and her questions and his answers and going to scripture and things like that. Well, at one point during the course of the conversation, the woman as she was cross stitching, she dropped her cross stitch on the ground and it fell face down and bottom up. Well, what happens? Well, it falls face down. You can't see the beautiful design that she was working on. All it looks like is a hot mess, right? And Moody's like, woman, what are you, what are you working on? This, this thing looks terrible. What, what kind of cross stitch is this? And she, she gasped, Mr. Moody, how dare you say that about my cross stitch? You're looking at it from the wrong way up. You're seeing the underside and you're not seeing the design that I've been working on top. And Moody, like a wise pastor says, ah, dear sister, you are doing the same thing to God. You are looking at the troubles and the trials of this life. You are looking at it from the wrong way up. You are seeing the underside of God's work and you are missing out on the glorious design that God is working through your trials and through your suffering. Don't doubt the goodness of God. Keep your eyes fixed on the big picture. Now, friends, that's, that's my encouragement to you today. Listen, I know, I know I just got here, so I don't know many of you all that well. In fact, I don't think I know any of you all that well, right? But I do know, because we are in a Genesis 3 world, that you are suffering. Everyone in this room experiences trials. Everyone experiences temptations, and Satan wants you to fixate on those things. But you need to fix your eyes on the cross and know that from God's perspective, the trials you're experiencing and the temptations that remain, like, Lord, why do I continue experiencing this temptation over and over and over again? Think of the apostle Paul. I prayed multiple times that you would remove this thorn from the flesh, but God is saying, my grace is sufficient for you. Don't doubt my goodness. Look to the cross 
and see my goodness displayed once and for all for you. See my love poured out for you. Look to the cross and see my son providing for you all that you need for life and faith. So friend, don't let Satan get you fixed on the moment and on the difficulties and whispering in your ear, telling you to doubt the goodness of God. God is good all the time, amen? He is our good God. So keep holding fast, right? With a white knuckle grip to God's glorious promises to you in the gospel. If we choose to reject God's goodness and take what God has commanded us not to, only pain and death will follow. And that brings us to point two, the consequences of sin. And the consequences of sin that we see in chapter three are immediate and catastrophic, right? Immediately the man and woman experience shame and fear. It's as though when they sinned, their eyes were opened and they were unmasked and exposed in their sin. Like now their, their fallen nature was apparent to them both. I think this is why we at times can feel so much shame when we've sinned. Not only because sin is shameful, but because in a sense, it shows us what's actually inside, right? If you've ever seen the first Lord of the Rings and you've seen a great picture of this, right? Remember at the beginning of the movie, uh, Uncle Bilbo reluctantly gives to Frodo the ring. He doesn't wanna give the ring up because he loves the power of the ring, but he does give it up. Frodo goes on on his journey. They later cross paths again. And Uncle Bilbo sees the ring hanging around Frodo's neck. And he says, my, I would would surely like to hold the ring just one more time. I would surely like to hold it. And Frodo very wisely says, no, no, Uncle, I, I don't think that's a good idea. And then what happens to Bilbo? His face changes into the face of a monster. He shrieks and screams and reaches out and lunges. If you've ever seen it in a movie theater, it's one of those scenes where you're just like, ah! Like everyone in the movie jumps because you're totally not expecting it. But then what happens to Uncle Bilbo after he returns to his senses? Covers his face and moves back into the shadows. Shame. He's ashamed at what's inside of him. In the same way, friends, We experience that when the sin that is inside, the flesh, comes out. And we want to move back into the shadows and hide, right? The ring reveals what's inside of Bilbo in the same way sin reveals what's inside of us and the man and woman hide from the presence of the Lord. Kids, I wanna talk to y'all for just a moment. I'm not sure if you've experienced this ever in life, but I experienced this when I was a kid. Because God has placed the knowledge of him in our hearts, we, we know right from wrong. We know when we've sinned. We feel things like shame and guilt when we sin. Uh, and when I was a kid, when I would do things wrong, I would often go to my room and hide. I would legit hide, like I was playing hide and seek for my parents. They just didn't know. And it was because I felt so guilty and afraid of coming into their presence, right? That's what sin does to us, kids. Sin wants us to hide in the dark. But, but what Genesis 3 is teaching us and what God is calling us to is to come out of the dark. So kids, if you have done something where you're tempted to hide it from your parents and you don't wanna confess, what God is, what God is saying to you here is don't hide in the dark. That that's what Satan wants. He wants you to stay in the dark where sin festers. He wants to convince you that you're dirty and shameful and that nobody will forgive you. But Proverbs says to us, where there is confession, there is mercy. God is a merciful God. But this is not a word just for kids, right? This is a word for all of us, kids and adults alike. Friends, if you are engaging in sin in your life and you are not wanting to bring it out into the light, please, Hear God ask, where are you? Just like he asked Adam, he, he's not playing hide and seek with Adam. He knows where Adam is. He's, he's asking the question to give Adam the opportunity to ask himself the question, why am I hiding from God, the God who created me? Friends, if you are hiding from God and keeping sin in the dark, keeping it in the dark only feeds it and makes it more powerful. You have to bring it out into the light. Let the light of Christ and the light of fellowship with other brothers and sisters shine on that sin so that you can put sin 
to death. Don't let shame, guilt, or fear keep you in hiding. You're gonna be tempted to think that God doesn't want you or won't love you, but nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus himself said, those who are healthy have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Jesus came for sick people. He came to heal us of our sins and spiritual diseases, and he tells us to come to him, sickness and all. You can't clean yourself up first. You have to come to me if you want to be clean, and he is the one who can cleanse us. But sin doesn't just produce shame and fear. Sin also brings about God's judgment. In verses 14 and 15, God pronounces judgment on the serpent, which we'll come back to. But then in verses 16 to 19, he pronounces judgment on the man and the woman, and his judgment can be summed up in one word, pain. Life will now be filled with pain. The joyous experience of bringing children into the world will now be marked by pain for the woman, And what was once supposed to be fulfilling and satisfying, working the land will now be filled with thorns and thistles and pain for the man. The ground is cursed because of Adam and he will toil it in pain. And that physical pain will be coupled with spiritual pain. Not only the spiritual pain of a severed relationship with God, but the spiritual pain of a once perfect marriage now broken. You see the pain of it. The two who became one now become because of sin are gonna be divided again against themselves. And this physical and spiritual pain is then followed by death. From you will toil the land and then you will die. From dust you were created and to dust you shall return. And just when you're thinking it can't get any worse, it does. Look at verses 22 to 24. God cast them out of the garden. He casts them away from his glorious presence. He casts them away from the tree of life. He places angels with flaming swords at the edge of the garden to keep the man and the woman from ever coming back in. Oh, friends, do you, do you see? Do you see the disastrous effects of sin? Though Adam and Eve had life, they now have death. Death. Though they had pleasure, they will now have pain. Though they once had abundance, they will now have to meagerly scrape out from the soil and by toil and pain. Though they had perfect harmony with God and each other, now alienation with God and conflict with each other. And all of this because they believed the lie that if they ate the fruit, their eyes would be open and they would be like God. Do you see the terrible bait and switch that sin and Satan holds out? Their eyes were opened, but they were not like God. Their eyes were opened, and they saw themselves as they really were. Sinners in the presence of a holy God. Friends, sin never delivers on its promises. Sin never delivers ever, ever, ever delivers on its promises. What are you tempted to give into today? What sin are you being tempted to give into today? What sin is Satan calling you to participate in promising that if you just actually take and eat, you will be the first human in human history who takes of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and eats from it and actually experiences good from it. It's never happened, not once. And yet, what are we being tempted to partake in today? And what do we often give into in our lives, right? It is a lie. And it's a lie from hell, friends. Sin never delivers on its promises. One of my favorite quotes about this on sin is this. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. It's a a profound thought. Do you know who said that? That quote comes from Ravi Zacharias. Many of you may be familiar with his ministry. He was an apologist, a very prolific Christian apologist, who after he died, it became clear from all of the sins that came out in his life that he took and ate often. And in the wake of his taking and eating, he left devastation and 
destruction. I do not say that for us to stand and heap judgment on Ravi Zacharias. If a Christian apologist who spent his life in Christian ministry could be so deceived by sin, you and me can be deceived in the same way. Sin never, ever delivers on its promises. Shame, fear, guilt, pain, death, exile. That is what sin produces. And this sad and wretched state is the state in which every human being comes into the world. We are prisoners of the kingdom of thorns, enslaved to our sins, imprisoned in this world of grief and sorrow and shame, not only because of what Adam and Eve did, but because you and I have also taken and eaten from that same tree. We've all chosen to live our own lives. We've all chosen to be our own gods at various times. And so like Adam and Eve, we, have, we too have been banished from God's presence, consigned to experience toil, frustration, physical and spiritual pain, and ultimately destined for God's judgment. Unless, unless God provides a remedy. And that brings us to point three, the remedy for sin. You'll see two remedies actually in this chapter, one that the man and woman create that doesn't work and one that God creates that does work. The first remedy that the man and woman create that is the wrong remedy is in verse seven. After Adam and Eve sinned, the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and what did they do? They sewed fig leaves together, made themselves loincloths. We see that they cover themselves with fig leaves. Ultimately, what this is showing us is that in response to the experience of feeling shame, guilt, and fear for their sin, Adam and Eve tried to cover their own nakedness rather than running to God where they should have gone for forgiveness, right? And this is something that is common to all mankind. This is basically the structure of every major world religion. Right, every, every other world religion other than Christianity essentially says the solution to the problems in the world is that we need to work ourselves out of them. In Hinduism, we offer sacrifices to the gods to appease them. In Buddhism, we practice the eightfold path. In Islam, we practice the five pillars. In secular America, we may not do the religious acts, but we do things like good acts acts of service, getting lots of degrees and good jobs, accumulating wealth and material things and trying to experience as much comfort as we can in this world. All of these are variations on dealing with the problem of human sin, shame, guilt, and fear. They are modern manifestations of trying to cover our own nakedness, but the problem is they don't work. You think of someone like Jim Carrey, famous comedian, who once said, I'm gonna paraphrase him here, he once said about being rich, he was like, I wish everybody could become as rich and wealthy and famous as I am so that they would find out it doesn't work. Or you think of Tom Brady after winning like his third or fourth Super Bowl in the 60 minutes interview. He's like, he has his next trophy and he's like, I just feel like something's missing. And we're like, yes, something's missing, it's Jesus, right? You can win all the Super Bowl trophies in the world, but that fig leaf is not gonna fill the hole in your soul. Interestingly, after that interview, a bunch of Christians, he said he got like thousands of Bibles in the mail because Christians are like, come to Jesus, hey, hey, know the one who can truly fulfill and who provides a true covering. And it's the truth, right? Only in Christianity do we find a remedy that is sufficient because only in Christianity do we find that the remedy comes not from us finding our way back to God, but God pursuing us and bringing us back to himself. And we see that in the passage. Do you notice how God pursues Adam and Eve? What they need to do in the wake of their sin is run to him, but they choose instead to hide in fear. But God doesn't sit back, he seeks them out. Look at verse nine. The Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Oh, friend, if, if you're here today and you are hiding in sin, hiding sin in your life, I hope you hear God speaking clearly through this word to you. Where are you? Where are you? Stop hiding. Come out into my life. Receive forgiveness. I can clothe you and cleanse you more than your wildest imaginations. We know from scripture that God knows all things, right? He's calling us to come out. He knows what's going on in your life. He wants you to come out into the light. 
My friend, I wanna encourage you, if you are hiding today, take that step out into the light. Take that, that first step and come and find forgiveness through God. But he not only pursues them, he also promises to crush their enemy. Look at verse 15. God pronounces judgment on the serpent, promising to send a seed, a child of the woman who will bruise his head. That word is elsewhere translated crush. A child is going to come who is going to crush the head of the serpent. But that isn't the end of the remedy. The remedy continues when God provides a covering for their sin. Right, their, their garments wouldn't do. Our garments won't do. Our accolades, our great Instagram feeds, our, our image on Facebook, those things will not adequately cover over our shame and our guilt. Look at verse 21. The Lord God made for Adam and Eve, for his wife, garments of skins and clothed them. The skins here almost certainly refer to animal skins, skins revealing powerfully again that sin brings death a sacrifice would be required to deal with their sin. But it's clear that sacrifice wasn't powerful enough to bring them back into their, to, to God's presence because they're still banished from God's presence. A greater sacrifice would be needed, one that could not only cover their sins, but also bring them back into God's presence. Uh, this, this is a powerful message and would have been a powerful message for the nation of Israel right? This chapter especially would have been particularly important to the people of Israel. Though they were brought back into the promised land, a land like Eden flowing with milk and honey, and though God dwelled among them in the tabernacle, it was clear that all was still not well between the nation of Israel and God. Why? Because when they approached God in the temple, they had to bring sacrifices. A sinful people cannot come into the presence of a holy God without sacrifices. But even on top of those sacrifices, they were still not able to enter into God's presence. What was in the Holy of Holies, outside of the Holy of Holies, but a curtain. And what was on that curtain? Two angels, flaming swords, proclaiming to all who approached, you shall not pass. When a sinful people come into the presence of a holy God, they will die. The true remedy had not yet come. And the people of Israel would come to the temple over and over again for hundreds and hundreds of years waiting for the coming of the seed who would crush the serpent's head. And we are not in a position where we're waiting for him to come the first time, but friends, we have the glorious privilege of looking back and realizing the seed came, the seed crushed, the seed clothed us, the seed cleansed our guilt and brought us back into the presence of God. Why do I say that? Because the Lord Jesus Christ came. Just as God pursued Adam and Eve in the garden, where are you? Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He lived the perfect life that we should have lived, and then he died on the cross, bearing the punishment that we deserve. And I, I hope you can see how in the cross, Jesus fulfilled the judgment pronounced here in Genesis three. What happened to him when he was hung on the cross? He was stripped bare, hung naked, his shame for all to see so that you and I who put our faith in him could be clothed by God and cleansed by God. Not only that, but on the cross, what did he wear upon his head but a crown of thorns showing that the curse of thorns and thistles he would wear like a king on his head saying, I am the one bearing the judgment that you deserve. Though you deserve to be naked, I will be naked for you so that you can be clothed by God and brought back into the presence of God. And we know that this is the case because at the climax of him dying for us on the cross, when Jesus breathed his last, what happened to the curtain in the temple? It was torn in two from top to bottom. God making it abundantly clear. The division between God and man has been abolished in the flesh of my son, Jesus Christ. Any sinner who desires to know me and meet me and be cleansed by me and forgiven by me and have an eternal relationship with me can come to me through the curtain of his flesh. You and I can come to Jesus Christ and know that God will cleanse us and forgive us and bring us into his eternal presence forever. Friends, that is good news, amen? 
Jesus has done it. Jesus has fulfilled the judgment that we deserve so that we can receive God's eternal blessing. So now, I, wanna, I just wanna bring you back into the moment. Satan's whispering to you today, God's not good. Your trial, your suffering, it's a sign that God's not good. But, but what is God saying to you through Genesis 3? My goodness far surpasses anything you could possibly imagine. Not only that, if you trust in me, you're gonna be united to my son by faith, and together with him, you are gonna crush the serpent. And his destruction is coming. So friends, we wanna focus today on the goodness of God. Charles Spurgeon once said, if you cannot trace God's hand, trust his heart. That's his word to you today, trust his heart. God is good. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Lay hold of him today and be cleansed and clothed and forgiven and reconciled. Join me as we pray, asking God for help us know how to respond to this. Father, we, we're just taken aback. We're taken aback by your love for us that you would send your son to bear the judgment that we deserve. Oh, Father, we pray for anyone who is hiding in the shadows today, anyone who is hiding sin in their lives, anyone who thinks that they are just too dirty and shameful to come into your presence. I pray that you would show them through your son, Jesus Christ, that they can come, they can be cleansed, they can be forgiven, they can be clothed, they can be brought in forever. So we pray for those who are waiting in the shadows to take that step of faith, to lay hold of Jesus by faith. We pray also for those of us who are struggling. We have believed and yet we're beset by trials and temptations. We're struggling to believe in your goodness. Help us to remember God today that you are working everything together for our good. Some of us are being tempted to participate in sin. This temptation feels overwhelming and we want to take of the fruit and eat. We think it's going to turn out good, but will you, would you show us today how destruction and death follow when we turn away from you? Oh God, we desire to come into your presence. We pray for those who have believed in Jesus Christ, who haven't taken that next step of baptism. We pray that they would come and be baptized, knowing the, uh, part, uh, de declaring to all the cleansing that they have received through faith in Jesus Christ. We pray for all of us today that we would respond by trusting in your goodness, by never doubting your goodness. Help us to hold fast to you by faith today, we pray. And we ask this all in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.